So here's a question, relevant question. Uh, you're in the supermarket and you push the trolley around and uh, you carry a basket. I, I don't know about you, but I always end up carrying a basket and then ended up with too much in it and I get sort of lines across my fingers and my arms get longer as I, as I go through. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No room for the handles over the top of the basket because it's too much stuff. Um, but there we are. Uh, you don't expect to go through the supermarket, push a trolley, get the tills and walk away. Because we don't expect to be able to feed our bodies for nothing, do we? What does it cost? It costs, well, time, energy, effort, but it costs those funny yellow things on the screen there. It costs pounds as well, doesn't it? And, of course, there's the thing of the house. Uh, we have to have a nice warm house to live in because, you know, we've got past tent, haven't we? And we've got past, you know, roundhouse, wattle and door. Uh, we've got to house, and, of course, house means mortgage or rent or something of that sort. And you don't expect to get it for nothing. You can expect to have a roof over your head be warm and dry without implications financially. What does it cost? It costs... Pounds again, uh, or dollars, wherever you happen to be, of course, if you're listening on the internet. Um, somebody listens in Sweden, I don't know what we have, it's crowned, is it? Krona? Krona. Krona, yeah, or whatever. Cost those funny things that you have to work for. And of course, you can turn up to the petrols. <coughs> this is a sore point at the moment. A number of our American friends are really, really moaning at the moment. The price they pay for petrol, <laughs> it just makes me laugh because. Uh, £1.40 a litre in Llandaila, £1.40 odd a litre in Llandaila this morning. Uh, for ordinary, uh, unleaded petrol. Um, so, you know, hey, it's expensive. You don't expect to be able to pull up to the pump and fuel your car and drive off without having to uh, pay those poor, struggling people at the oil companies a little more to help them uh, because they're struggling so badly at the moment. And one company, fairly local, has been fined £50,000 for price fixing over the winter. Right. Okay, we're not going to put that on the internet, so I hope that didn't come out. Yes, I do. What does it cost? There's only one locally we're talking about. Okay, so would you expect to pay for this, or would you expect to get it for nothing? Because what happens is we get into the mindset of getting things for nothing, and, and then we, we treat it as if it's either of no value, or we expect to get it for nothing. None of us is going to question the propriety of sharing our money with the supermarkets to feed our body. None of us. Really? Are we? No, unless we're, you know, really, really far out anarchists, okay? Are you? No, it's okay. Uh, mortgage company. We, 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 you know, we know. We, we work on this basis. You pay for the place you live in and, and keep it warm and everything else. We, we know about that. The oil companies, poor people, feeding our fuel tanks to get around. So, why won't we feed our Bible teachers to feed our souls? Because I hear so much from guys that I know about churches that are feeling poor, about churches not being willing to set aside for the support of the ministry to feed their souls. And God's got this funny system in place. I didn't invent it. And it's, it's there to look after our souls, just the way the supermarket's there to look after our body. And there's an attitude around, in Wales in particular, that says you should get food for your soul for free, as a Christian. Now bear in mind what I am saying there and what I'm not, right? That's the, that's the proposition. Far less do you get situations where Christian people are prepared to pay and feed someone somewhere else. To feed the Bible into the souls of, you know, poor benighted souls who haven't realised the value of this yet. It doesn't happen. Now obviously I'll pull a bit of a stunt here with this picture on the wall, because given the appearance of the picture in this picture, he looks definitely very dodgy. I don't think I'd put much value on here in this guy either. I don't think I'd want to put much money into that process. But the bottom line here is that these guys need a house to live in, a place they can afford food in, and some means of transport to get to where they'll do what they do on behalf of the people of God. And that needs to be dealt with. Just like everybody else, they'll need those things, but they'll need more than that. Those are just the main headings. And Jesus said, where your treasure is, is where your heart is. Didn't he? Where your treasure is, is where your heart is. If we value the gospel, 
And if we value the truth in Wales as believers, as evangelicals in Wales, well, where our heart truly is, is where we put our treasure. And Jesus said it the other way around. Because where your treasure is, is where you will truly put your heart. Of course, because of what they do, these guys get to know about all sorts of things. And, and they, they, they have expenses that are not the same as everybody else as well. But that's just another question. Let's establish the main principle. The principle is this. Most people get to spend time doing their work, which takes up a good part of their life, and they get paid for that as compensation for giving up their life as a postman. You go and do your post evening, which you wouldn't do naturally, but you're, you're, in, you're giving your life in return for the money that will sustain your life, aren't you? Hours of it. See what I mean? As a teacher, you're giving hours of your life to these rewarding, suppliant, you know, begging to be learning more, children, and, and you're giving up your life to that. And what happens is, there's money in the bank at the end of the month to help you buy your food and run your car and have your holiday. That's the equation. Now, some of what I'm going to say comes as a shock to some churches, I'm sure it doesn't to you. But, but preachers don't wake up each Sunday morning to discover that the latest RSS, RSS feed from heaven has put today's sermon on their hard drive. There are churches that work as if that's how it works here. What's he doing all week? Well, hopefully. He's doing something useful that's going to feed your soul. They don't have that RSS feed from heaven onto the, onto the hard drive on their computer enabling them to send Monday to Friday at work, then mow the lawn and do the shopping for their wives on Saturday morning, take kids to dancing or sport or whatever on Saturday afternoon, before having people to dinner on Saturday evening the way everybody else does, and they're getting that to preach the word on Sunday morning. Can't be done. Preparing to preach the word of God on Sundays, if we take it seriously and if we mean it, preparing to do that on Sundays, and to teach it throughout the week means you have to do specific reading and preparation for Sunday. It means you have to do extra Bible reading and praying during the week. It means you have to do general Christian book reading to keep your own learning fresh so your preaching stays informed, interesting, up to the minute and ready for people to feed from. Otherwise their souls, their souls don't get fed. And of course we'll be tired if you don't manage that. Whatever else you can do during the course of the week. Because you actually, as somebody, as a very learned elderly bloke at my Bible college once taught us, only as good as your last sermon. That is painfully true, isn't it? And then, in these days, there's all the internet stuff you need to do. And there's the visiting you're expected to do. For the elderly. And the meeting and the greeting you have to give time for. As well as the direct outreach and the evangelism. As well as resourcing the people with, with the church with people and money that has to be taken into account too to be able to make the process all happen. Now, see, it's quite, I'm in quite a fortunate position here, because I know none of you actually think that sounds like something you can do properly alongside a full-time job that earns the money to enable you to do it. You can't. There aren't the hours. Trust me, I don't sleep much. You can't. So why does the Welsh Church seem so keen to act like you can? Is it an economic problem? Or is it a spiritual one? And a question of what we actually value. What we really take seriously. That is what Paul is teaching about in Galatians 6.6. 6. The support of the preaching, teaching, pastoral ministry. Now, I, I know we can't do what we want to support Bible ministry here. Believe me, I know that. But the trouble with what I'm currently doing here is that I'm afraid of, of by default, through doing what I'm doing here, teaching the opposite of biblical truth, as if that's the norm. And as if that's right, and it's not. And that concerns me. Because hopefully, either I'll move on and do something else, or I'll shuffle off my perch. Fall off my perch, shuffle off my mortal coil. I'm mixing my metaphors because I'm shattered. <laughs> and somebody will have to come behind me. I don't want to leave a mess for somebody else in this area. Let's face it, <clears throat> the ministry Paul talks about here, the Bible teaching which 
goes on in church to feed your soul. That ministry that Paul's talking about here is on a buy one, get one free basis already. You realise that? The Christian ministry is, is there on a buy one, get one free basis. You, you knew that. Let me show you what I mean. Where does the Christian ministry come from? In the Old Testament, there were two sorts of religious leaders, weren't there? There was the Levitical priesthood. Their job was to run the temple, worship, and uh, offer the sacrifices, and basically make the praying happen. And then there was, I confess, my favourite bunch. There was the Old Testament prophets who were there to fearlessly proclaim the word of the Lord. You know the ones? Great guys. Hairy, wild people who lived in deserts and places like that. Marvellous bunch of characters. Elijah and Elisha. Isaiah, who wanted his job? Jeremiah, the minor prophets. Zephaniah, what a character. Amos. I was neither a prophet nor a prophet's son, but I was a grower of sycamore things, but the word of God came to me and you better listen to us. What a carry on. You look, the poor to be Amos in heaven, he's going to be a real hoot. There were two sorts of guys. There was one there concerned with doing the praying stuff and making all that happen, the worshipy stuff, and there was the sort of guy who was there to make sure the people heard the living word of the living God. Where does the Christian ministry come from? In Acts chapter 6. Both sorts of prophets and uh, Levites were materially, were financially provided for in Israel. The law made stipulations about the tribes, where they were to get their livings from, when the land of Israel was divided amongst them. Levites had no land given them. The Levites were just given dormitory towns, because their inheritance was to be to the, to the priestly work, attending to the prayers at the temple, and the laws of Israel made provision for those people as they did their work. Prophets, they weren't provided for in, in legally stipulated ways, but the people knew. The people basically made sure the prophets had what they needed. They took gifts when they went up to inquire after the word of the Lord. Even visiting foreign officials coming to Israel to inquire after the word of, of, of her living God, people like Naaman the Syrian in 2 Kings 5 and so on, they expected to give money or give gifts related to their, to their needs to the prophets who, who told them what God was saying and helping them meet with the living God. But what happened when the New Testament ministry came along? At the beginning of the book of Acts, it's all there in Acts 6. Here we go. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them, so you've got mainly, mainly Hebrew Jews because we're in Jerusalem, okay? But you've got this group of the Grecian Jews, the Greek-speaking Jews from the Greek-speaking world. The Greek-speaking Jews amongst them complained against the Hebraic Jews, who spoke Aramaic, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. As if the local Welsh-speaking church and the local English-speaking church had a problem between them. Does that put some flesh on the bones? So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it isn't right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. What's happened is a quarrel has broken out about a practical issue, and it's detracting from our ability to minister the Word of God. And it's by the Word of God the church lives. So this is the solution. You brothers who've got the complaint. You Greek-speaking Jews who've got the problem. This is really going to your brother and giving him all you can. You guys pick out a bunch of guys, seven men from among you, who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. Look at the list of names, they're all Greek names. Wow! The Hebrew Christians have said that to the Greek Christians. You come and take over the money. We'll turn this responsibility over to them. We'll give our attention, say the apostles, to prayer and the ministry of the word. Now everybody realizes what's happening there in terms of, you know, the apostles are overwhelmed with the practical things in the church and so on, so they give it to these guys, and these guys are good guys anyway, but you know, blah, 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 blah. What people don't see is this. They've combined two previous ministries into one. We'll give ourselves to the ministry of the word of God and prayer. So the function of the Old Testament prophet and the Old Testament Levite is now two for one in the teaching ministry of the Church of God. Can you see what I'm getting at? Is there a point there to be made? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I made it obvious. That I, it's buy one, get one free, guys, okay? So when we're talking about supporting the biblical New Testament ministry, it's two for one. 
Bricks without straw? No. Not quite. <laughs> so long as the straw is provided, the ministry of the Word of God and prayer is far too, be, too important to be prejudiced by all these concerns about the, the money and the complaints and so on. Where does the ministry come from? Historically, the praying and pastor teaching ministry arises out of Acts 6. Spiritually, it doesn't arise there, because Paul makes very clear in Ephesians 4, its origin is not in the church, its origin is in God. Ephesians 4.11 it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. Come back to that in a minute. To prepare God's people for works of service. What could be more important? So that the body of Christ might be built up. What could be more important? Until we all reach unity. Here's the means by which we're all going to reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attain to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. How are we going to do that? Word ministry and prayer ministry. How important is that? In the eternal plan and purpose of God, which is to bring all things together again under the headship of Christ, Ephesians 1 says, here, says Paul in chapter 4 of Ephesians, is how God is going to do it. By word based ministries in the church. Um, I've written myself a note in black bar or a scribble on the side here because I didn't manage it last night to say, change the slide and explain the Greek. Okay. <laughs> oh, I'll just do that in five minutes, give me a minute. I'll just pull it out there. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. And then you can miss the point. Okay, Alto said, okay, he gave two some to be apostles, some then prophets, some then evangelists. Some then pastor teachers. One bunch of guys are going to be apostles. I'm, I'm oversimplifying this to make the point. One bunch God gave one bunch of guys to be apostles, one bunch of guys to be prophets, one bu bunch of guys to be evangelists, and one bunch of guys to do the two for one offer in the church <laughs> to be pastor teachers. See the point? I hope you find that interesting. Because it's, you know, it's worth going into the Greek for all that, wasn't it? Yeah, no, it's okay, moving on. Let's get to the point. What is Paul then saying in Galatians 6? 6, 6? There is the biblical pre-understanding for all that will be said. So now let's look at what Paul's got to say a bit about it here in Galatians 6, 6. Anyone who receives instruction in the Word must share all good things with his instructor. Seems pretty plain, doesn't it?